St. Paul summarizes our epistle for tonight. In the last verse, he says, We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoicing in God. It's what we do as Christians. It is now and always has been really our central task in this life. From the first day that Adam and Eve walked in the garden, the first priority was to rejoice in God. However, rejoicing in God, according to St. Paul anyway, comes in two parts. Rejoicing in hope and rejoicing in suffering. We're pretty good at the first part. Paul tells us that we are to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And remember, when Paul uses that word hope, it's not a call for, for optimism. That's the way we tend to use that word. You know, I hope my stock goes up, or I hope the teacher doesn't call on me since I didn't do my homework, or I hope that weird gurgling noise the toilet's making doesn't mean a lot of money and trouble is coming. <laughs> It means that we're unsure of, of what's going to happen to us or around us. Paul, on the other hand, uses that word hope to communicate the certainty and the joyful expectation that he has. When we want to communicate that idea of certainty and joy, we say something, I think, like, I can't wait. We say, I can't wait to retire, or I can't wait until my vacation. The point is that when we use that word hope, there's always an element of doubt in our mind. But for Paul, no doubt, none whatsoever. So rejoicing in the hope of glory simply means that we can't wait for life in paradise to start. Because we are fully aware that we live in a sinful world in sinful bodies with all you sinners. But we look forward with great expectation to the day when all of that sin is removed. And we get to see God as he intended for us to be in the first place. Until then, we walk in this veil of tears. And I know it's not a particularly upbeat view for one's life. And frankly, that view does not play very well in our culture today. It's just not happy enough. It's not upbeat enough. And that brings me to the second part of rejoicing, according to Paul. When we rejoice, we not only rejoice in the hope of glory, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. You know, there's a kind of a popular belief that's been around for centuries and centuries that God is sort of the cosmic clockmaker and People still kind of like that idea. Many thousands of years, God wound up the universe and set it in motion, and now he just sits back and, and watches his creation play out, sort of like a, a kid watches a train set. You know, there's a certain amount of joy in watching a train set, at least for me there is, but there's really precious little that needs to be done, right? It's just one of those things you kind of sit and watch. Now, if God were a clockmaker, if indeed he had just wound us up a long time ago and, and let us run, what would have become of us? I'll tell you, we would all be spiritually dead. Our faith would have starved to death a long time ago because, folks, we're not all that good at taking care of our physical bodies. And we can see them. I mean, we're told that being a couch potato is at epidemic proportions. Americans are generally overweight and out of shape. Teenagers, they say, teenagers have dangerously high cholesterol and have arteries that are already thickening when they're in their teens. Why are we in such horrible shape? Well, there's not any, probably one single answer, but lack of activity and poor eating habits are certainly at the top of the list. We sit in our offices, we sit in front of computers, we sit in front of the television, we sit in our cars, and you hear what the common element and all that is. Sit. And then because, frankly, by historical and worldly standards, we are so wealthy, 
then we can afford really rich food and junk food, which takes more work to burn off, not less. And there are many, many people who get up every morning, look in the mirror, and are in disgust at what they see. They see the results of a sedentary, overindulgent lifestyle, and yet, if we're honest, most of us, including myself, do very little about it. We transform into couch potatoes and just accept it as though it were our destiny. Now, my point is, if we do that with our physical bodies, which are in plain view for ourselves and everyone else to see, what might we do with our spiritual selves, which is not so easily seen? Thank God that he's not a clockmaker, that he didn't just wind us up and let us go, but rather he is intimately involved each and every moment with our life and with our faith. That's why we rejoice in our suffering. Through suffering, God grows and strengthens and feeds our faith. Paul says suffering produces perseverance. That is to say, when we suffer, we learn how strong our faith is. I mean, when you go to the weight room, as most of us don't, <laughs> but if we did, how would we ever know how much weight we could lift? We would just have to try, right? And see how much we could lift. Well, suffering forces us to persevere. Suffering forces us to push ourselves towards new limits, to discover new strengths and new abilities. And then perseverance, Paul tells us, produces character. See, God did not put us on this earth to be stupid, flabby sinners. Our purpose has always been to glorify him and to work hard for him. When Adam was placed in the garden, he was to work tending the garden. And it was only when he fell into sin that his work ceased to be a joy and became toil. See, prior to sin, Adam didn't need any suffering, didn't need to produce perseverance, didn't need perseverance to produce character. Adam had it all. However, now we have sin. And if we are to develop character, we have to have suffering. See, character is the result of overcoming trial. It's the result of having been baptized by fire. And it is crucial, really, for us to be people of character because the Holy Gospel has been entrusted to us. If we are to transmit the gifts of God to those who do not know him, we have to have character or they will not value those gifts that are given to them. I mean, think about it. If you decided that you wanted to hike Denali National Park to go on the wilderness survival trip, would you want to have a guide who has never left Villa Park? <laughs> Probably not. Likewise, no one wants a faith guide who has no character. And remember, by the way, the very first people for whom we are faith guides are our own children and the children of our family and the children of this parish. I mean, those are the low-hanging fruit for us. Finally, Paul says, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Exactly. Through our suffering, God produces in us character to spread the hope, his hope. And were it not for suffering, we would have couch potato faith, weak, flabby faith that would be utterly useless to the Holy Spirit. And if our faith is not usable, how would anyone come to know Jesus? Because we're the tools 
that the Holy Spirit uses. We're the tools with which he spreads the gospel through his word and his holy sacrament. Lord, save us from weak, flabby, couch potato faith. We rejoice in God. We rejoice both in the hope of the glory to come, and we rejoice in whatever our present suffering is. For it is in our present suffering that he builds in us the strength we need to be the vessels of the Holy Spirit. So that more and more people may come to know the hope of glory that we know.